Hello everyone, it's Michael here and today I'm going to be doing a random maze generator inside of the Unreal Engine 4. Uh, so this is a tutorial, so hopefully uh, some of you will be able to follow along and, and hopefully create this yourself. Uh, today I'll be using the implementation of the recursive backtrack algorithm. Uh, so some of you may have, have seen my previous uh, implementation of this particular uh, tutorial many years ago. Uh, hopefully this one will be easier for you to sort of follow along with and, and create. So yeah, without further ado, let's get, get on with it. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to do is create a brand new project. Uh, we'll just go ahead and launch the editor. I will be using version 4.26.1. Uh, this particular tutorial, it may work in some of the older versions. Just be aware that there are certain things I might use that might not be available in, in previous versions. Okay, so we're just going to go ahead and create a brand new project. I'm going to select games. Um, for myself, I'm just going to go ahead and select a blank project. Blueprint. Yes, they're all fine. Okay then, so we've got our project open. First thing I like to do is just create a few folders. So I'm just going to create one, I'll just call it Blueprints. And then I'm going to go ahead and create a second folder, I'm just going to call this uh, Meshes. Okay, so the first thing we want to do is go ahead and create a, a, a blueprint, a brand new blueprint. So in my Blueprints folder, I'm going to go ahead and create a new blueprint class. Uh, for this particular one, I'm going to go ahead and pick Actor. I'm just going to call this BP uh, Maze. There we go. And do a quick save. Okay then. Yep, so I've gone ahead and got that uh, particular blueprint open. Uh, go to the event graph. I'm just going to quickly move some of, remove some of these. Okay then, so the first first thing we want to go ahead and do is actually create a few macros before we get constructing the actual algorithm itself for the maze. So the first one I want to go ahead and do is, uh, is create a macro that will get a random location uh, within our maze size. Uh, in a way. So I'm going to go ahead and create a brand new macro. I'm going to call this get rand lock in bounds. Okay. So. Uh, first thing I want to do is go ahead and add some inputs to the macro. So I'm just going to go ahead and add two. The first one needs to be an int point, like so. And we'll just go ahead and call this size. So in essence this will be the size of the maze. Um, so when we refer to the size we'll sort of refer it in terms of tiles. So whether it's 20 by 20 tiles or um, 200 by 200. The next input is going to be a random stream. Uh, I'm just going to call that rand stream. Okay. Uh, so what we want to go ahead and do is break the int point. And then we want to pull from the random stream input and get a random integer in range from stream. So we do need two of these, uh, one for each the x and the y. So I'm just going to copy and paste that. Bring these up. Okay, and then we just want to go ahead and connect the X up to the top max, and then the Y to the bottom max. What we then want to do is actually make an int point. So we can drag from here and make int point, and just connect the X and Ys up. And from the int point, drag to your outputs, and it'll create a brand new uh, output. Uh, I'm just going to quickly rename this to a random lock, like so. Okay, do a quick tidy up. Lovely. Yep. So that's the first macro done. Okay. So the next macro I want to go ahead and create is called get 
neighbor location. So what this will do, um, when we're sort of referring to the locations, uh, in essence the tiles, so this is going to get the tiles next to the input tile. Uh, so what we're going to do, well, get all of the surrounding tile locations. So what I'm going to go ahead and do is create a new input. I'm going to call this target. And it needs to be an int point for the variable type. Uh, we then want to add a second input, and this needs to be of integer. Uh, I'm just going to call this distance. So this is the distance away from that target tile that you're looking for. Um, this itself does only function in terms of like the cardinal axes, so straight up on the x or, or straight down on the y, that type of thing. So what we want to do now is go ahead and pull from the target and want to add some plus, plus int point nodes. So I'm going to head and add four of those all together and just connect them all up. Like so. And then I actually want to go ahead and then make an array. So you can think of these as north, east, southwest. So north, east, southwest. So they get added to this array and it's going to output all four of them. So I'm just going to call the output neighbor. Like so. Okay. So the next thing we then need to do is determine what we're actually adding to the target for each of the elements in the array. So I want to go and drag into there and I want to go and make a int point and we'll need one for each of the add nodes. Like so. So the top two are straightforward. Just want to go and drag distance straight into the X and distance straight into the Y like so on the two top nodes. And then for the bottom two uh, what we actually want to do is get the negative value of that. So what we can do nice and easily is just multiply the distance by minus one and that'll just invert it. And then we can plug that into the X and the Y. So what this macro will do is take the target and it will output the, f the four locations surrounding that particular tile. Okay, yeah, so that's that one done. So moving on to the next macro we want to create. Um, this one is to get both the neighbouring tile and its bridge. Uh, so what I mean by that is when we're getting the neighbour tile that we want to move to, what we actually do is, is we get we get it that's two tiles away. Um, and the one in between that would only be one tile away is what we sort of refer to as a bridge tile. Um, I'll sort of explain a little bit more in terms of why we do that when we get to that particular sort of section of the tutorial. Uh, it's all to do with sort of backtracking and, and that side of things. Uh, but for now, I just want to go ahead and create a new tile, uh, a new macro. I'm going to go ahead and call this get uh, neighbor and bridge, like so. Uh, what you can go ahead and do is just add in two of the get neighbor location macros that we've just created. So what we can do, nice and easy, straight from the target, move one of those to the input, and do the same for um, uh, yeah. So then the top one wants to set the distance of two, and the one underneath the distance of one. What I want to do in terms of these arrays, I want to go ahead and pull from it and get a copy. So we need to do that for both of them, like so. And then for the indexes, for the get, just drag that to the input because this will be supplied for the input of the, uh, the macro. I'm just going to go ahead and rename the input to index. And then lastly, we just need to drag these as outputs and I'm going to re rename these to floor and bridge. So the top one will be the floor tile that we ultimately move to and then the one underneath is the bridge tile and I forgot to connect these up. There we go. Yeah and the bridge tile is the one between the floor and the target tile. 
Okay, so that's that macro complete. Right then, so the next macro we want to create is one to check the supplied tile location to see whether or not it exceeds the bounds, uh, aka the size of our, our maze that we've specified. Now the reason why we need to do this is because as we're sort of iterating through the algorithm, uh, there may be points where it might move away or move outside of that size. And we want to make sure that if it does that, it can't do anything. It just sort of says, no, that's not a valid spot. So go ahead and add a new macro. I'm going to call this uh, check and if block exceeds the size. And what we want to do is we need two inputs. First one is going to be an int point. So this will be the, the, the location that we're, we're providing, the location that we're checking. And then we need one more, and this will be the size. So this is the size of the actual maze. So I want to go ahead and break both of those out. And do that with the size, like so. And then we want to, for each of the X and the Y, do a less than check. So what we're saying is, is the either the x or the y less than zero? Uh, if it is, then it's it's exceeding those bounds on the small side. And then what we then want to do is from the x y check to see if it's greater than the x and y for the size. So this just means that it's bigger uh, than it should be. Okay, and we just want to go then add an or variable or all comparison. So if any of these are true, it means that it's, it's exceeded. So this output would be true. And then we'll just drag that to the outputs. So we'll rename this to exceeds size. Like so. And there we go. And that's that macro done. Tidy up. There we go. Okay, then. So now we've done the check if location exceeds the size. We need to make uh, one more macro, and this one is going to be check is valid location. It's a valid log. So this is actually going to check if the supplied location is is valid at all. Um, so we will need that macro we've just created. So we can drag that in, and if we just drag from the location and the size onto the inputs, it'll automatically create those input variables for us. Uh, so we do need two more inputs, and these need to be int points. The first one is going to be path tiles, or, or path locations, um, it's up to you uh, how you want to call that. And then the last one needs to be a bridge tiles. So in terms of these variable types, and obviously in points, but they do also need to be sets, uh, as shown there. So you just click on the little icon next to it, and you can choose from the list. So depending on the version of Unreal Engine 4 that you are using, you may not have sets available. Um, if that's the case, it is possible to do the same, th similar thing using arrays. You may just have to modify some of the sections where the, the sets are used. Okay. So the next thing we need to do is drag from the path tiles and the bridge tiles and we just want to check to see whether or not the location that we've provided, so the tile, is within either the path tiles set or the bridges set. Just like so. And then we can just come from here and connect them to an or. So if, if any of these are true it means that the supplied location isn't a valid tile um, that we can move to. So the reason why is because if the target tile is already in the paths, it means we don't want to move there because it's already in, in the, the, the array, uh, the set as it were. And uh, similarly with the bridges as well. So from here, I just want to go ahead and do a, a not node. And this is just going to flip it. So if this is true, uh, it means the output's going to be true. But in terms of whether or not that's a valid location, we need it to be false, so uh, and then we just drag that into there. 
Okay, so that's this macro done. Okay, so there's one last macro that I want to go ahead and create, but I actually want to go ahead and create this in a slightly different place. So for this particular one, what I'm going to do is go to the content browser uh, and within the blueprints folder, and I'll right click, come down to the blueprints, and I want to ha create a blueprint macro library. Um, the reason why is just means that this particular macro can be used within other blueprints. Uh, so I'm going to do that, and then for the uh, class type, I'm just going to go and choose object uh, for that. Call this custom lib and then save. Okay, open that up and it will automatically create a brand new macro in there already. So I'm just going to go ahead and rename this. Uh, and what I'm actually going to create is called a, a do n. Uh, a lot of you are probably already thinking there's already a do n in UE4, uh, and you're correct. Uh, but this is a, sl a slightly different version of, of the do n uh, just because it has a slightly different output. So in terms of the do n, it only allows an output n number of times, whereas the one that I'm going to be creating, it will also apply an output if you've exceeded that nth value. Uh, so you can still do something even if something goes in. Um, it just takes a different route. So in terms of this particular macro, uh, it'll be very similar. So I want to go ahead and start by adding some inputs. So the first one, that to be an uh, execute input like so and then we want to add another execute and that's going to be reset and then we actually want to add the in input variable uh, which is a float uh, sorry an integer and that's going to be n so it's exactly the same inputs as the, the do n uh, for the output, I want to add uh, an integer as well, I'm just going to call this nth. Uh, and then we need two more executes. Uh, I'm just going to do exit. And then last one called over nth. Okay, so it says the over nth one. Uh, once we've gone past the nth, value so the end that we've inputted it will always output over the the nth execution line instead of the exit so that's sort of the, the sort of the difference so it turns setting this up I'm going to drag off the main execution line on the input I want to go ahead and add a sequence uh, from the then zero I want to go ahead and add a do a once node like so uh, so the next thing we need to do is actually assign a local integer variable. So the way this works inside of macros is to add a local variable you have to do it through this particular menu here. So just type in and type in local and there should be an option for local integer and it'll give you a little bit of a box. So in a way this itself is your local variable so it's not named or anything like that. Um, so what I want to do is drag from that and click assign. So this is how you would then set this value so this local integer inside of a macro. So with this connected, we do want it to be a uh, value of zero. So with the assign created, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and set up the reset option as well, and that's just running straight through past these two uh, to the assign. So that's just going to, whenever you reset, it's just going to set this local integer back to zero again. Okay. okay so the next thing we want to then do is drag from the then one and add a, a branch node. So what we actually want to do is from the local integer we want to check to see whether or not that local integer is less than the nth value. Like so. So just drag from the input of the nth and connect it up there and connect that to the branch. Just going to do a little bit of tidying. So then the next thing we need to do um, is if the local integer is still less than the nth value, we want to actually go ahead and add one to it. So we'll just drag from here. And what to do plus int. So it's just going to add a one. We'll need that again in a moment. So it's going to add a, a reroute node there. 
once we've done that, we then want to actually assign it again. Uh, so assign the variable. So from the true, connect to the assign, connect to the variable chain up, to the variable, and then we can input the value. So that means whenever it's done this check, if the local entry is less than the nth, it's always going to add one to that particular value. And we can go ahead and connect that straight up to the exit. If it's false, which means it's n or over, uh, we can just click on over n. Like so. And the last thing I want to do is just connect up the local integer straight up to the nth value. And that's just so we can get that particular value on the outside, just as you can do with the do n. Okay. So yeah, so that's that particular uh, macro done. Uh, as I mentioned, the reason why I put it in a custom macro library is just so it can be accessed in other blueprints. Um, in terms of the project that I use this particular image generator in, uh, it's, it's a function that I've got in my custom macro library. So now it's time to start setting up the actual functions for generating the maze. So if just go back to the main uh, maze blueprint and go ahead and add a new function. I'm going to go ahead and call this uh, generate maze, like so. Uh, and for this, we're going to need two inputs. So I'm just going to add, add, add those. The first one I'm going to add is size. Uh, this needs to be an in point, but just a single a variable type. The next one I want to go ahead and add is a integer. And this is going to be a seed. So this is the seed that we're going to provide to the maze generator to generate the maze. So that way if we provide the same seed, it'll always produce the same maze. So from here, what we then need to do is actually add some local variables. So up in the top left, just locate the local variables section and add a local variable. Uh, for this, I'm just going to call create one called uh, rand stream and this needs to be a variable type of random stream like so. so what we then want to do is start off by actually setting the seed for the random stream so let's grab a variable and from there search for set random stream seed and we can connect that straight up like so and connect the seed input variable for the function Like so. Now the next thing I'm going to do is just drag from the size and actually just, just promote that to a local variable. I'm just going to call this L for local underscore size. And connect that up like so. So the next thing I want to do is actually create two more local variables. Uh, this first one's going to be a starting location. So this is where, within th the size that was specified, we want the image generator to actually start. Uh, I'm going to choose it to start at a random location based on the seed, uh, which I'll get to in a moment. And then I'm going to add a, a second local variable, and this is just going to be called current location, so current lock. Uh, just need to make sure we change the variable type to int point. That for both of those, like so. Uh, then what we can do is we need to set these. So just drag them into the blueprint and set them and connect. So the current location will be where in the maze we're currently at that we need the algorithm to move from. Uh, so to begin with, that's always going to be the starting location, so we'll just connect it up like so. Uh, in terms of getting the starting location, as I mentioned, it's going to be a random location based on the seed. So uh, one of the first macros we made was to get random location in bounds. So we can drag that in and connect it up to the starting location. Okay, right up there. So for the inputs, we want to plug in the random stream and the size local variables like so. So with 
this particular section done, what we now need to do is actually move on to another function. Uh, so go ahead and create a new function. I want to call this one add neighbor uh, location. So this is actually where sort of the algorithm itself starts taking sort of shape. So there's actually quite a few inputs that we need uh, on this particular function. So first one I want to do is add a int point and this is going to be for size. And we'll just do a pass by reference. So if you just check the little option at the bottom there. Uh, the next one to add is the a random stream. Let's just call this a random stream, like so. And yet again, you want to make sure it's passed by reference. Uh, the reason why is because when we input a the variable into here we want to make sure it's using the same stream throughout everything that we do otherwise if we're constantly generating a brand new stream each time it's always going to reset the uh, the integers so it's not going to be that random so if that done the next one I want to add is a is the current location so this one needs to be an int point like so, and just do that as current lock. Uh, and we want to add one more. This one's going to be path tiles. This one, yet again, is going to be an int point. Make sure the pass by ref is selected. But this time, this one wants to be a set, uh, a set variable type, which is that one there. We're going to again add a, another one this input is going to be bridge tiles yet again in point and as I've set and add one more it's going to be called to check and then add one last one and this is going to be called end paths okay, compile and save Okay, so within the function itself, we do want to add a local variable within here. So on the left hand side again, look for the local variables tab and add a new one. I'm going to call this neighbor index. And this needs to be a variable type of integer. So there's a little bit of setting up to, to start with. <laughs> so drag that in, I want to go ahead and set it. And what we want to do is actually set it to a value between 0 and 3. Uh, we want to do so from the random stream. So because this random stream is set to pass by reference, uh, we can actually get a reference to that very input uh, in here. So we just type in rand stream, and we should be able to get the variable type. Uh, so this here is whatever has been passed through into the function. So from here, we we'll then want to do a get a random um, integer uh, random integer in range from stream so that's what we want him so min is 0 and the max would be 3 and you can plug that into the neighbor index okay so let's move these over a little bit so the next thing we want to add is a, a branch node Uh, so we're just going to connect that up to there. So what I want to do now is actually get some of the uh, locations to start doing some checks. So we can actually go ahead and drag in the get neighbor and bridge uh, macro that we made. Uh, and for this we want to connect up the current location. So yet again, right click and search for current lock. Yet again, so in terms of the name, it is, it's exactly the same name as what's on the input there. So because we've got the pass by ref, uh, we can grab, grab a reference for it. And connect that to the target. Uh, for the index, we want to get the local variable that we created. So that's neighbor index. And we'll do that there. 
the next thing I want to do is actually check whether or not uh, the outputting variable is, is valid or not. So drag in the check is valid location and we can plug in the location there and we also want to get the size. See so again this is the size that's been inputted into the uh, input the function. Next two we want to connect is the path tiles and the bridges. Like so. And we can then just connect that up to the branch. Like so. Okay, so I'm just going to quickly go through and explain what's sort of happening here. So we're getting the current location where we are. Uh, and then we're in essence getting both the tile two away and then directly next to it based on the index that we're providing. So if we assume zero is north, it's going to get the north tile for the floor and the bridge. So that's sort of what's happening there. Okay, so let's go back to the add table as well. So once we've got that variable, we're then checking to see whether or not it's a valid location or not. So going back into the check is valid node obviously we check to see whether or not it's outside the bounds so either on the X or the Y uh, but we also check to see whether or not that particular location already exists within the path tiles or the bridge tiles okay so there's a few things we need to do now depending on whether or not the location is a valid location or not so if it is a valid location um, we want to add it to our path tiles and uh, the bridge so what I'm going to do is just go and set these nodes here and just, just copy and paste them. Uh, it's going to be exactly the same sort of setup. What we then want to do is get a reference to the path tiles and the bridge tiles. And then we also want to get the to check variable as well. So what we want to do is we need to add a variable to each of these. So let's drag from them. Click add, add, and add. And we want to just connect these up in a line from the true on the branch. So we want to add the floor to the path tiles and we also want to add the floor to the tiles to, tiles to check. So in essence what's, what's happening here is we found a valid tile, add it to the path tiles and that means that that particular tile, that location is a part of our maze. We also then add it to the to check list so when we are backtracking we know that we need to check this tile again because there may be other branches that, that could be possible. Okay, uh, and then the last one is the bridge tiles. So we can go ahead and just connect that up there. Let's do a quick bit of tidying. Like so. Okay, so now to the sort of recursive sort of section of it. So what we actually need to do now at this particular point is actually call the add neighbor lock location again. So within the function we're actually calling the same function again. So what we want to do here is is in essence just plug in all these variables. However with the current location we want to set it to the valid floor tile that we've set. So we can just plug that straight into there. And let's move these up a little bit, try and straighten some of these lines. Um, from here, we're just passing the same variables in that the original function over here gets passed in. So you can just drag from them and get them all. and end paths. Okay. Let's 
do a little bit of tidying on the function. Okay then. So now, in terms of the true path, oh, I'll do that. Um, that's this particular section done. What we now need to do is deal with what happens if it's not a valid tile. Um, and what we actually want to do with this neighbor index, we actually just want to move on to the next value so we can do the same check again. So if we've got one particular tile and we've checked one side and it's not a valid side, we can check one of the other sides. So what we can do from here, um, drag from the false, and I want to add in that do n plus macro uh, that we created. And for the nth value, I want to go ahead and set that to 4. Uh, from here, we then want to go ahead and set this neighbor index again. So I'm just going to copy and paste that, and we can connect that straight to the exit. Like so. What we then want to do is just grab the local variable and we want to go ahead and plus one to it. So we're incrementing it. Of course, in terms of the neighbor index, we're not starting at zero. Uh, it could be it starts any any random number between zero and three. So it, once it gets to th uh, four, we want it to actually loop back around to zero. And it's quite a nice, quick, easy way to do that. So for the input there on the neighbor, just go ahead and do a select, a select in, and just do a quick check of greater than or equal to. In this instance, it's going to be four, and then just click that up to B. So what's going to happen here if it is greater than or equal to four? It's going to set the value to zero. If it's not, it's just going to add one to the value. Okay. So at this particular point, what we then need to do is actually loop all the way back round to this start of the branch. So I'm just going to go ahead and connect it up to there, and just add some reroute nodes just to make it look a little bit easier to follow. Like so. Okay, so in terms of this particular function, uh, we've actually pretty much done. Uh, that, in, in essence, is done. However, there is actually going to be one additional function we want to quickly create for this particular uh, function. So let's come back up to the function, go ahead and add a new one. And I'm going to go ahead and call this get uh, neighbor. Count. So, in the add neighbor location, if we've looped around here f four times and we've not found a valid location, uh, it means that that particular tile is is done. There's no f there's nowhere else it can go. So, generally, what we want to do is actually check: is it an end tile? Uh, so it's like an end path. Um, if it is, it would only have a neighbor count of one, uh, just because there's only one one location, or sort of one tile next to it. Uh, and that's how we're going to sort of determine whether or not there's any end paths. If you're not wanting any to know where your end paths are or your end tiles, you can skip this step step altogether. Uh, but I'm pretty sure that if you're generating something like a maze, you're probably going to want to be able to generate things at the end of the maze and, and things like that. So. Coming back to the get neighbor count, what we want to go ahead and do is uh, go ahead and add two inputs. So, first one, current uh, location. So, I'm just going to do current lock. Uh, it needs to be an input, point, uh, but just a single variable. And then go ahead and add a, another one, and this time it wants to be path tiles. <coughs> um, this one does need to be a set, and you also want to make sure the pass by reference is uh, selected as well. So, what we want to do now is get the neighbor locations. So, we'll drag from the drag that in and connect the current location to the target. For the distance, we want to go ahead and set this to one. And the next thing we want to do is from the neighbors, just do a for each loop, and we can connect that up to the main execution line. 
Um, the next thing we want to do is add a local variable. I'm going to go ahead and call this counter. Like so, it needs to be of type integer. From the loop body of the for each loop, go ahead and add a branch. Okay, so what we want to do now is, is actually check is this array element within this path tiles array. If it is, then it means it's it's next to the tile. <coughs> if it's not, then it means it's not as a it's not a part of the path. So what we can then do uh, is just get the path tiles. Because it's yet again as it's because it's set by reference, we can just grab the uh, variable there. And we just want to drag from it and get a contains item and connect that to the array element. And we can connect that up to the branch. Like so. Uh, if it does contain it, let's grab the counter local variable. I want to do a plus plus. So the increment int. So what this will do is we'll just take that integer and just add one to it. Which is all we need to do. And then from the complete, uh, drag from it and just type in return. And what we're going to do is add a return node. Uh, and then from here, we want to add an output. And that needs to be of integer type. And that's just going to be of count. And yeah, I just want to make sure this is a single variable. And then add in your count variable. So once it's finished looping through, it will then just output the, the counter. Okay then, so now going back to the add neighbor location function, what we want to go ahead and do is drag in the get uh, neighbor count function that we've just created. So in terms of this particular function, what we want to do is connect that up to the over nth on the get counter uh, on the sort of loop that we've got going here. So once it's been through four times, what it'll do, it'll get the neighbor count. And what we want to do is we want to check to see whether or not that's equal to one. Uh, if it's equal to one, it means it's an end tile, if it's been able to loop all the way through. So from here, just add a branch. Uh, I just want to plug in the current location. And the path tiles. Okay, and then we then want to get the end tiles, uh, so end paths. And just go ahead and add the current location. So I'm going to copy and paste that from over there. So this is just going to be a list of the end paths, uh, just just for easy reference uh, later on should you need it. Okay. Right then, so with the add neighbor location function complete, I uh, want to go ahead and go back to the main generate maze function. So in here, go ahead and add the add neighbor location into here, and you can connect it straight from the uh, set current location. So what we want to do now is start by just plugging all these variables in. So grab the size. And make sure it's the L size. Like so. Want to get the random stream. Current location. So, in terms of the path tiles, bridge tiles, to check tiles, and end paths, we actually need to create these as local variables. So, I'm just going to go ahead and quickly do those now. So, prompt to local, uh, so that's path tiles. Drag from the bridges, prep to local, so that's bridge tiles. And lastly, the end paths. Okay. Okay. 
Okay, so what will happen in regards to this particular function here? Um, when we call this particular function, it won't actually output here until everything's completed in here. Which means that if this gets called, it will keep going until it gets to the point where it has to stop and then it will sort of go back down the chain as it were. So once this does actually execute, what we then want to do is to check to see whether or not there's actually any tiles to check. So we're just going to grab the two check local array and then to get the length and we want to check to see whether or not that's greater than uh, zero. If if there's elements in the to check array, it means there's something that we need to do. So we can, in essence, backtrack at uh, this particular point and go backwards. So I'm just going to drag that off of there and connect it up. Like so. Mm. And what we can then do is I'm just going to quickly add a return node. And let's connect that up to the false. And we want two outputs. So in this instance, I'm going to do the path tile and the end paths. So I'm going to drag those onto there. So do that uh, path tiles out. Okay then, so we've got one more function that we need to create, and this one is going to be called backtrack. So we're going to create a new function and just name backtrack. So for this particular uh, function, uh, we're going to need four inputs altogether. So these will need to be of point int. So the first one is going to be the current tile. The next one is going to be the two check uh, set. We also need the bridge tiles. And we need the path tiles. Okay, then. so what I want to do now is just get drag from the two check you want to convert it into an array. So this is just something we can actually loop through um, and get sort of a reference from. So what they want to do is get the last index of that array. So the way sets work is they tend to get the elements get added in order. Um, it's not necessarily guaranteed, um, but with us looping through in the same sort of tick as it were, um, they will be in the, the order that they're added in. Um, of course with sets, if you're manipulating them and adding and removing them, they're obviously not guaranteed to be the case. Uh, but in this particular instance it's perfectly fine. Uh, from the main, from the two array, I want to go ahead and get a copy. And the one we want to do is the last index. Like so. The next thing we want to do now is actually set the current tile to this value. So what we can do is get the current tile. Uh, because it's done a, as a pass by ref we need to use um, a specific set node. So if you just type in set there should be one that says set by ref var and that's the one that we're wanting. Uh, this means that we're setting the variable that was passed into the function. So we can go ahead and connect that up and we want to plug in that input there like so. Uh, the next thing we actually want to do is remove it from the two checklist. So we've got the two check and we want to do remove and we can kind of connect that up as well. So we add it so we set it to the current tile but then we also remove it from the two check. Okay. Yep, so that's that section done. Now what we need to do is actually do something similar uh, with the uh, bridge tiles. So the ones in the two check list is there's always the main path route that we're, that we're sort of going. So whenever we're setting the current tile to one of the old paths, we need to make sure that we're setting 
the bridge that we've gone past to the pass as well. So to do this, we want to grab the bridge tiles. Uh, to array. And want to do a similar thing here where we're getting the last index from this array. Like so. Okay, and then I want to get the path tiles. Sure, it's passed by ref. There we go. Like so, and then we should go to the path tiles. We go in and add. Yeah, so all we're doing here is just adding the bridge to the path tiles, and yet again, we want to go ahead and then remove that particular entry from the bridges. Like so. Yep, so that's the uh, backtrack function done. So now if we go back to the generate maze, what we want to go ahead and do is drag in that uh, backtrack function and connect it up. Uh, and at this particular point, it's just a case of plugging in the different variables. Um, so the current location, the two check, the bridge tiles, and then the path tiles. Making sure you're getting the correct variable types. Yeah, and once it's done the backtrack, we just want to go straight back to the add neighbor location. Let's just add a reroute re node. Like so. So at this particular point, the algorithm itself is actually complete. Uh, we could call this function and we'll get a list of all the locations within the path uh, for the maze. So all we need to do now is just go ahead and create some sort of setup to actually take those locations and, and spawn something in the world, uh, some sort of static mesh. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go ahead to the current uh, the, sorry, the content browser and just import uh, a mesh. Uh, I'm just going to go and head and import uh, a plane, so you can import whatever you'd like. Okay, so that's my mesh imported. As I mentioned, it's just a flat plane, it's 200 by 200 uh, units, so 2 meters by 2 meters. Um, yeah, and it's just got a, a green material on it. Okay, so Going back to the maze blueprint, what we want to go ahead and do, uh, just going to this quite quickly, is add a instance static mesh. Uh, I'm just going to choose the hierarchical instance static mesh. Um, so we've got that there. Okay, so the, we're going to actually use this to spawn a mesh in that we can then visibly see. So for the static mesh type, we're going to choose that plane that I imported. Okay, so now we can just drag in the uh, generate maze. So for the blueprint itself, we can go ahead and create a variable for the seed and for the size, like so. I've just promoted these by dragging off the function. Uh, but what I'm going to do as well is set an instance editable and expose on spawn. This means that when we drag the blueprint into the scene, we'll be able to edit them. Uh, within the scene itself. Um, a good thing to do with the size, uh, just because it, it can regenerate each time, is for the slider range to actually specify a, a, a limit. So I'm going to go ahead and do that at uh, 40. 
Um, so this just helps prevent you from setting a ridiculously large value and then ca causing your editor to crash, which is not what we want. Okay, so I'm not going to connect it up just yet. Um, so what I want to do now is from the path tiles, go ahead and convert it to an array, like so. And from here, I want to do a for each loop. Nice and simple, and then drag in your instant static mesh uh, reference, and drag from it. And want to choose add instance. Uh, like so, and we can connect that up to the loop body. And add, make a transform. So what we need to do now is just specify the actual location. So using these. Uh, what we've generated in the maze we can do that quite easily. So I'm going to go ahead and break the in point. And um, what we want to do is give it a sort of a tile size. So I'm just going to add a new variable on here and do that as tile size. And do it as a float and set it as instance editable and express on spawn. Uh, my plane is 200 by 200 so I'm going to set the tile size to 200. Um, so all we need to do is multiply these, both the X and Y, by the tile size. And we can then plug those into a make vector to get your X and Y locations. Okay, so this itself should actually work. So I'm just going to go ahead and set a size of 10 and then plug it in. Okay, so if we go into the scene and just drag in the maze and set that to 0. Okay, so as you can see it's generating the maze and you can cycle through the seeds and you can see the sort of the effect that it has. Uh, one thing just to be aware of in regards to this particular implementation uh, if the starting tile is an odd number and you've got uh, an even number, uh, sometimes it may be slightly shorter. It's just one thing to be aware of. Um, but as you can see, randomly generates. And uh, with something in, such as this, generally you can tend to do up to 200. Uh, it normally takes a few seconds just to generate. But you can get a huge maze generated, uh, all based on the seed. Of course, trying to cycle through the seeds with with large um, maze types can cause the uh, editor to to stall, which is obviously just one thing to be aware of when you are playing with uh, something such as this. Uh, but obviously, looking at the maze that has generated already, uh, you can see the sort of patterns and things that it uh, generates. So yeah, so thank you for watching. Uh, I hope you find this useful. Uh, if if you have, feel free to drop a like on the video uh, and by all means leave a comment and, and obviously let me know what it is that you've been using it for.